Now we're going to talk about decorators, and these are just shortcuts, basically, just syntactical sugar to create a wrapper function, which is what we were doing in the last video. So let's recreate that scenario. We had a factory function called time this. And we inputted in some function, and we wanted to time whatever function that we imported in. So in order to do that, we created a wrapper, and because we didn't know what kind of arguments this original function took in, we went ahead and just tried to make it as versatile as we could by accepting in an arbitrary amount of arguments, and also an arbitrary amount of keyword arguments if they did that. And now we just got the current time, and then we ran their function. So function, and we ran it. And again, we didn't know what kind of arguments their original function they passed in took. So we use the ones we're going to input in the argument and we unpack those. And we unpack them very similarly to how we input them in. As you can see, it's the same syntax here. And then just in case we return a value from this function, let's also save that. And so now let's stop our stopwatch after they run their function. So we'll get the current time. And to be able to find out how much time this function that they inputted took to run, we're just going to subtract these two values. So run time would be our stop minus our start time. And then we wanted to let the user know, hey, this is how long your function took to run. So we made a formatted string and we got the function name. And so this is what we had here. We had your function took this many seconds to execute. And after we did that, we went ahead and returned the value that we saved up here. So that now our wrapper function acts just like our original function, except we're adding on a start and stop timer every time we call it. And after that, we even did a little bit something cooler, which was to change the name of wrapper to equal whatever function they input it in. This isn't necessary to do, but it was kind of nice to have this. And we also added on timed so that there is a little bit of distinguishability. And so now our factory function called time this, we returned our wrapper that we created just like that. So now that we have this factory function, we use this on other functions. So let's create another function here to sum up all the numbers until a specific point. And then if we wanted to time this sum to function, as discussed in the last video, what we did was say sum to equals, and then we used our time this function to create this wrapper function, except we wanted to run our function in the middle of that wrapper function. So we have to give that information here. So we just put sum to. Now every time I use sum to, this will now calculate how long it took that function to work. So you can see it says sum to took this many seconds to execute. And some of you might be thinking, okay, well, if we reassign sum2, how are we calling sum2 within that function, right? Because we're putting that function into here, but if I reassign it, how is it still calling the function? Well, we've also learned from previous lessons that I can assign a function to any other name I want. I can do that just like this. And now I can call my function like this, but also I can call it with the original name. So now I have two ways of calling the same function. I could keep doing this. What if I wanted a third way to call sum2? I'm not moving this function into this name. I'm just saying, hey, I want this name variable to also point to the same exact function that sum2 is pointing to. So now I have yet a third way to call this function. And I can prove that these are all pointing to the same function if we just got all their names. And you can see when I run this guy here, look, all of them are called sum2. And if you got their IDs as well, um, they should all be referencing the same memory location. So if we, we put ID here, Notice when I run this as well, look, they're all using the same exact memory addresses. So now I have three ways of accessing this function. So my original name called sum2 doesn't have to be one of the things that access this function anymore. In fact, I could delete sum2 and I'm not deleting the function. I'm just deleting the binding of this name variable to that function. I still have two other ones that allow me to access it. So now I can still print out ASDF and put in, let's say, 5 here. And you can see that this still works. We get 15, even though sum2 would no longer work. If I tried to put sum2 and call it, the name sum2 is not defined anymore. So that's an important thing to note. In fact, I can assign this to something completely different. Let's assign it to a number. Now when I try to print it out, again I get, hey, int object is not callable. This is no longer a function object, it's an integer object. So now I have to reference it like this, and you can see that it prints out what value. So all these names in Python, it's better to think of them all as just pointing to a specific place in memory. They're not actually holding an object, they're just bound to a specific place in memory so that I can get that information. So going back to this example, when I'm saying sum2 equals 
time this and I'm inputting in sum2, what I'm doing is changing sum2 to equal a completely different function called wrapper. But I'm saving sum2 into this function variable. Basically, I'm saying function now equals sum2. And now inside this wrapper, f(u)n(c) is referring to my original sum2 function. So it doesn't matter if I change this to something else. All that to say is that from last video, there is a shortcut to do this operation. And that shortcut is a decorator. And we use a decorator by a, right above our function that we want to apply. We use an at symbol and then type out our function. So time this. And this right here does the same thing as doing sum2 equals time this and inputting in the function sum2. The way these work is you put the name of a function that accepts in one argument that will store the location of this function that you're using it on. And now you can see that when I call my sum2 function, we'll say 20 million. If you forgot, you can use underscores and numbers without affecting them. But now you can see sum2 took this many seconds to execute. So cool, now we have an easy way to any function that we have. If we have a function called test here, if I want to time this function, all I have to do is say at time this. And as long as this function here accepts in one argument, then I'm good to go. Now hold up, what if I wanted to input in a little more information than just the function name sum2 or just the function name test? Because right, this is all that it accepts in is one function. As soon as I change this, and I say also accept in, say, a number here, this no longer works because this decorator the way it's set up, it's going to say, hey, we're missing one required positional argument number. So you might think, well, I can just input in that number right here, right? And will it work there? Well, no, it won't. In order to get around this, of course, you could just not use decorators and go back to your old way of doing things. Sum2 equals time this input in sum2, and then also input in your other arguments, right? Now, if I get rid of this, now this will work. But I want to be able to use this decorator syntax because I like that. Well, okay then, if the only way that this decorator works is with one argument that accepts the current function, then I'll just make yet another function to create my time this function, and I'll input in my argument into that. And so what I mean by that is let's create a function I guess we can call it make time this. And then we can input in whatever other arguments we wanted. Maybe we wanted to have an allowed integer right here. And so let's indent all of this code here. What this allowed thing is going to do is say, if my function goes over the time allowed, then I want to say how long it took to run. So basically, I'll just say if the runtime took longer, so it's larger, then the allowed time, then I'm going to print out that this function took this many seconds to execute. You might want to optimize it. So now it will only alert me how long a function took if it took over a certain amount of time to run. In my make timeness, I'm going to return my timeness function. Now how does this work? When I want to time something like this sum2 function, I can say make timeness. And now I can input in how many seconds I want to allow this function to run before alerting. So let's give it one second. If my function takes longer than a second to execute, maybe I need to optimize some of the code in this function. It's going to work just how any other factory function works. It's going to input in this allowed time right here. So it'll input in a one right there. And then it will return all of this time, this function right here. So all of this is going to turn into time this with the exception of now this variable inside of that is going to equal one or whatever we input it. And you can see that if it takes longer than a second, I'll say that you might want to optimize it. Let's do a lesser value here. Let's do 15. And notice when I run this, all I get is the answer back. I don't get my alert saying that it took too long to run because it didn't go over the time allotted. We could even have a default here saying if our functions are taking longer than 10 seconds, you might want to optimize it. So now I don't have to put in an argument, as you can see there. So the way to do this manually would actually be to say sum2 
equals make time this input in your amount. So we'll say three seconds. It will return a time this function in which we can input in sum two, like so. So this would be the manual way to do what this is doing up here. And let's get rid of the decorator here. And you can see that when I run this, it still works just as you would expect it to. Just to make this stick, all a decorator is doing is just taking whatever function you have, let's call it test, and it's inputting that name into another function. All that means is that we have a function called make return five that accepts in some function name here. That's all the requirements for this to work. In fact, if you just wanted to return five and not even use the function called test that's passed into it, that would be fine. What I've done here is I've changed test to be just the value five. Now test is just a regular old variable that is equal to five, as you can see here when I run this five. So this isn't really conventional, but all we're doing is saying test is now going to equal make return five, and then I'm going to input in test. All of make return five returns the number five. So all of this is now turning into five, and I'm setting that equal to test. So now this function doesn't exist anymore. You could even make, notice I'm not even using the function I'm going to be inputting in, which is going to be test. I'm just going to create another function and return that function. So now test is going to be passed in as function name, but I didn't use it. I'm just creating another function, returning greet, and assigning this new function I have to equal test. So now test is a function called greet that accepts in a name. So I'll just put my name here and we'll run this and you can see it says hello there Jeremy. So technically you could use a decorator even if you're not going to use the original function name. Although we learned in the last video it's a lot easier to just say test equals make return five and then it'll create this function for me. So let's change this to make greet so it makes more sense. There's no need to use a decorator to create this as you can see like so. Thanks for watching. Talk to you guys in the next one.